Eh, empezamos, si os parece. Pa... Bueno, eh, voy a hacer la introducción en español eh, con acuerdo de, de Lucy. Para nosotros es un gran, gran honor que esté aquí Lucy Abra Midou, porque llevamos muchos años conociéndonos y le debemos mucho. <risa> Porque, bueno, aparte de porque ha sido una excelente eh, huésped, hospedadora, eh, anfitriona de, de nuestro estudiante de doctorado, eh, llevamos muchos años trabajando juntos, al principio casi sin, sin conocernos personalmente. Eh, confió desde el principio en nosotros, en lo que nosotros hacíamos, con lo cual, bueno, pues de agradecer. Y dice mucho de la persona que es, que yo creo que, que, que también quiero destacarlo. Creo que es una persona que se desvive por, por la didáctica de la ciencia, que, que hace grupo, que genera mucho grupo en, en los sitios donde va y que además eh, hace comunidad, no solo a través de Internet, que os recomiendo que la sigáis a través de Twitter y Facebook, sino que también hace comunidad porque comparte muchas cosas de, de gente muy diversa. Entonces, eh, la verdad que eh, es una gran pregonera de lo que se está haciendo en el área. Pero además colabora con la Asociación Europea, con ESERA, es miembro del, del ESERA Boards, y además eh, eh, lleva y, y organiza la Summer School de ESERA, con lo cual, eh, de hecho, ha sido nombrada la mejor supervisora ¿no? de, de Holanda de, por sus estudiantes de doctorado, cosa que eh, es raro ¿no? que, que los estudiantes de doctorado que están tan estresados que al final reconozcan que, que su director o directora es excelente, pues dice mucho de ella. Y recientemente, pues, eh, alguno de sus artículos ha sido nombrado como uno de los mejores del 2020. ¿Por qué digo esto que, que es eh, interesante? Yo creo que la gran cualidad de Lucy ha sido eh, poner en valor eh, la eh, investigación narrativa y ponerlo en, el, en las revistas de mayor impacto del área, ¿no? En revistas donde tradicionalmente todo era cuantitativo, pues ella ha sido capaz de hacer estudios narrativos de calidad que han sido muy valorados por, lo, por los referees de la, de la revista. Bueno, aparte ella es eh, miembro de editorial de varias revistas súper importantes, o sea que tenemos aquí a, a una de las top eh, five de, del mundo. Es un placer. Gracias, Lucy, por venir a Almería. Thank you very much to visit us. So. Thank you, Ruth. Buenos días. Uh, gracias, Ruth, for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, I didn't understand much, but it sounded, <laughs> it sounded really beautiful. Uh, I got Facebook, Twitter, etc. Super important. So. <laughs> Uh, I take it that uh, she shared good things, uh, but it's a great pleasure to be uh, with you today. Um, I really love the Spanish community and all the wonderful work that comes uh, out from, uh, from Spain and your group, uh, specifically in science education, so I'm super happy um, to be able to spend time with you today and share uh, a bit of what I do. Um, I'm going to do it in English, obviously, but uh, let any time that you feel lost, uh, please interrupt me. And I have a couple of people here who can help with translation. Uh, so I chose a kind of a general title for this talk today, uh, Social, Cultural, and Gender Issues in Science. Uh, what's identity got to do with it? And I chose this kind of more broad title Uh, because I wanted to kind of give a broad overview of the work that I've been engaged with in the past uh, couple of years. And I will share in the beginning uh, a bit of theory and, and justification of why I do the work that I do, and then I will share an example uh, of a European project uh, that I'm working on with uh, my team and six other partners from different parts of Europe uh, as a concrete example uh, of what I will share in the, in the beginning. So why identity? Uh, this is a picture that I took last night uh, in Almeria. 
Love and Riot. Ignore the tattoo, though I've been looking into getting a, a tattoo. But uh, I share this because identity has to do a bit with love and a little bit with riot, and I will explain why uh, later on. Uh, but as a bad teacher that I am, I'm already giving out the answer uh, to the value of science identity. This should come at the end, but I chose to share it with you uh, at the beginning uh, in order to kind of provide a basis uh, for understanding for what will follow. Uh, I engage with work uh, with science identity because identity can challenge the taken for granted image of science who is a scientist, who can be a scientist, and what it means to become or unbecome a science person. And I think these are all uh, important questions, especially for future teachers, and I'm happy to see a few of you uh, in this room today. Science identity provides us with a lens to examine equality, uh, not through numbers, but rather through recreating new conditions for equal participation in science. And perhaps this is where both love and riot comes into, come into play. Here is a bit of uh, where I come from um, and where I work the past six years. I've been working in Groningen. I know that most of you know Amsterdam. Groningen is not Amsterdam. We are about two hours away north uh, from Amsterdam. It's a smaller city. And I work at a university that now has uh, a bit over 45,000 students. On a rare sunny day, it looks like what you see on the left, uh, beautiful canals, beautiful uh, blue skies, a uh, lot of bicycles, but this is very rare. Uh, reality is what you see in the second picture. We get a lot of rain and um, strong winds uh, throughout the year. So as I said, I started working in Groningen. I'm originally from Cyprus. Uh, I studied in the US, um, and then I went back to Cyprus, and in 2016, uh, I moved to the Netherlands. Uh, it started in 2017 with this amazing woman, Nouril Manfarida, one of my, my first PhD student in the Netherlands, who graduated um, a few months ago. 2022, how it's going. Now you see a picture of uh, almost all members of my team. Uh, I'm very privileged to have a really wonderful team consisting mostly of women from different parts of the world. Um, here you see a presentation of Greece, um, Brazil, the US, Netherlands, um, and Jamaica. So um, I'm going to share a bit of who I am since uh, I'm going to talk about identity. Um, as I said, I come from Cyprus. I studied in Pennsylvania in the US. Uh, then I spent a year in London uh, where I work at King's College uh, London. And that's where I started being interested in out of school science. And I'm going to talk more about that uh, today. So you see that I moved a bit around uh, the world. And here is a, a few pictures uh, just to get you an idea of who I am. These are things that I like to do. Uh, you see pictures of a few of my favorite people in the world, my niece and my nephew, for example. Bicycles, I'm, I'm obsessed with bikes. Um, cats and lemons uh, as a someone who comes from Southern Mediterranean. And in the last two pictures, you see, I hope that you can recognize at least one or two or three people in these pictures. <laughs> uh, so you see Ruth and Maria and Francisco. Uh, the first picture is in Bologna at a conference we all attended um, uh, in 2019. And in the last picture, you see Francisco uh, with a few other members of my team. Francisco spent four months uh, with us, and we loved uh, having him. So now that I share a bit about myself, I would like to, uh, to get to know if you, some, uh, some of who you are, 
uh, but I will not ask you to share, don't panic. Uh, so, but I would like you to think, if you can, for a few minutes, uh, think about who you are and write down perhaps or note in your head five of your most important identities or qualities or experiences. Is this clear or do we need to translate? It could be words, it could be symbols, drawings, poems, sentences, whatever comes to mind. I think we're ready. Okay, super. Uh, for those on YouTube, thank you for joining us uh, from wherever you are. Um, you don't, those on YouTube, you don't have to find a partner. Um, but those who are in the room, uh, I would like you to now find someone in the room uh, that you rarely interacted. Uh, that might be difficult, I think, in this room. Someone whom you don't know. Uh, it could be me. Uh, and then take turns talking about yourselves without referring to anything from your list. Oh. 
So do not use anything for what, uh, of what you just took note of. Uh, those on YouTube, you can talk to your imaginary friends, uh, if you have any, or t uh, with yourself, if you can, uh, if you're able to, to do that. And again, we, want, we don't have to, to share. And mostly I'm interested in how you experience this uh, in terms of feelings or emotions. So when you're engaging with this, uh, trying to introduce yourself without making use of any of the words that you just took note of. How does it feel like? And let's spend a, a couple of minutes uh, on this. Those on YouTube, feel free to share with us either on WhatsApp or Twitter um, or email if you want, and uh, we can share it with everyone here as well. So I see that my team in Groningen is watching. Thank you all. Uh, so please, uh, since you are watching, share with us on uh, WhatsApp, and we will share it with everyone. <laughs>
okay, I think we're ready, right? Um, so, yeah, as I said earlier, we're not going to do this, but the reason I ask you to engage uh, with these activities to kind of think how, how did, does it feel like, how does it feel like to uh, introduce yourself without actually sharing uh, identities or experiences that are more prominent to you. And we receive a few responses uh, through social media. Um, most of them are irrelevant, but thank you very much for engaging. Uh, we do have a really relevant uh, response in Spanish, and I would like to ask Ruth to share. Eh, una compañera nos eh, escribe diciendo que, que primero que es muy difícil eh, eh, hacer esta actividad porque es como describir a alguien que tiene los gustos parecidos a ti pero que no eres tú y al mismo tiempo es que parece como que quieras ocultar quién eres el tema vale gracias <risa> Thank you, um, and thank you whoever uh, shared this with us. So this activity in a way kind of offers a metaphor for how students are forced to silence parts of their identities in order to fit into the dominant culture within education. And of course, this is more relevant to students from specific social groups. And often these silenced parts or identities are essential to who they are or to who we are, religion, ethnicity, social class, uh, community, gender, sexuality, ability, uh, are only a few. And this is exactly why I engage with research on, uh, with science identity, because science identity offers us uh, the tools and the frameworks to study these questions. So here you see, um, this wheel that uh, offers a set of identities, uh, examples of identities that might be considered privilege um, or might act as, um, as um, tools for oppression. Uh, so think, for example, about um, being white, being male in a male-dominated field. Uh, think issues related to gender expression like um, masculinity and femininity. Think about uh, social class, uh, language bias, um, colonialism, uh, being heterosexual uh, in a very heterosexual world, um, and stuff like that. So these are the questions that I, that I engage with uh, in my work. Now, why science? Um, for me, a main reason behind, besides the love that I have for science and physics especially, uh, I engage with research in science because uh, sciences and especially physics uh, remain male dominated fields uh, and not very diverse. Uh, so researchers have referred to physics especially as a world uh, without women. And I'm sharing here a classic uh, book by David Nobel, a historian, who uh, studied the characteristics of modern science uh, through a comparison of science and uh, cl Christian clerical work. So here are a few of the conclusions of this work that are important to science and science education. Uh, science is presented um, with a strict separation between the subject and the object, the person who does science and scientific work um, priority is given on the objective over the subjective. Um, science is quite often presented as depersonalized and disembodied discourse. Scientists are presented as asocial, um, stripped of their, all the other identities. Um, scientists usually are presented as being totally committed to the calling of science. Um, quite often in the science discourse or popular media, uh, we witness um, um, a distinction between scientific career and family life. The two are perceived as being incompatible. Uh, so in a way, you cannot be um, a successful scientist and at the same time have a um, 
a healthy family life. Uh, and of course, the alien, uh, science is alienated from and dread of women, and this is uh, especially relevant in physics, which remains uh, the least diverse and the most male-dominated field. Another reason why I engage with work on science or with research on science is uh, surrounded with questions related to culture because science is often presented as a culture of no culture. And again, I draw from another uh, well-known book on ethnography uh, that a physicist, Sharon Trawick, did uh, when she compared uh, through an ethnography the life of high-energy physicists in the US and in Japan. And essentially what she found is that uh, in both of these contexts, scientific practice requires an objective, rational, uh, meaning emotions or feelings have no place, a social decontextualized researcher or a scientist, and a person immune from context, from culture. And I'm interested in these questions uh, or the culture of science because the culture of science is associated with questions related to who can do science or who can be a scientist uh, or who cannot be a scientist. And identity offers us uh, the tool to examine these kinds of questions. So to sum it all up, uh, in pictures at least, sci science is presented as a, a scary, a very masculine field, a competitive field uh, as well, with in many ways comes in contrast with uh, gender expressions, especially, especially femininity. Um, but let's dive into science identity. Uh, I will try to give a very kind of um, background or very uh, basic definition of science uh, identity. So if someone has um, a strong science identity, that kind of translates into the following. Science is my thing. Science is me, which means I, I self-identify with science. Or I relate with science. On the contrary, a weak science identity translates to, um, uh, to phrases such as science is not my thing or science is perceived as other or something foreign, something uh, distant from me and my world. So here is a, a brief uh, definition. Uh, science identity refers to if and how people see themselves, uh, self-view as science persons and how they are recognized or viewed by others. And when I use others, I refer to family members, colleagues, uh, students, um, and teachers, and also the society in general. So the issue here becomes of one when there is a conflict between self-view and, and recognition. So when I say I see myself as a competent science person or as someone who can do science, but the feedback I receive from my environment, say my parents uh, or my teachers, is the opposite. So they say, no, you're not good in science, then we experience a conflict between ourselves and their environment. And this is why research on science identity uh, is crucial, because we engage with such questions. So I'm going to try to exemplify this with a brief uh, video. This is from an advertisement in the US. And what I would like you to, uh, to take from this video, think about, it's a very short video of two minutes. Uh, the protagonist is a young girl, and you see interactions between a girl and her family. While you're watching this, I would like you to think about how does this girl see herself, which refers to self-view, and then think also how is she seen by her family or her environment. I hope this works uh, also for those on, on YouTube. Who's my pretty girl? Sammy, sweetie, don't get your dress dirty.
Sam, honey, you don't want to mess with that. Let's put him down. Samantha, this project has gotten out of control. Whoa, hey, careful with that. Why don't you hand that to your brother? Our words can have a huge impact. Isn't it time we told her she's pretty brilliant too? Encourage her love of science and technology and inspire her to change the world. So I hope that helped uh, make it a bit more clear, but what I wanted you to take away from that is uh, essentially the different influences on someone's uh, identity. So beyond the interpersonal, uh, the desire to engage with science, uh, we have influences that are at the institutional level, uh, that would be university or a school, teachers, societal, cultural, so the messages that we receive uh, from our em social environments or from the media. And of course, there are um, influences at the political level, and this refers to access uh, to science, or essentially questions that are associated with who has access to science, who has resources to engage with science, uh, who has financial uh, sources to engage or to study science. So essentially, in my work, I'm interested in question in the in the question of what kinds of identities are seemed in or out of place in science, and I chose this um, this picture from a recent paper that I published because it kind of shows the kinds of identities that we don't usually see in science. Uh, think about your science teachers. Though Spain is doing extremely well in, in gender equality, um, but think about what the messages that you receive from the media, um, movies related to science that you watch recently. How often do you see a scientist sitting on a wheelchair? How often do you see a pregnant woman uh, in science movies or in posters um, advertising science events? Um, uh, how often do you see Muslim women uh, wearing a hijab engaging with science in popular media, uh, in movies, um, and so on. So these are the questions that I'm interested in. Um, and what I will do now, I, I will share a concrete example of a project that uh, myself and my team is engaging uh, with that kind of puts in practice uh, at a more practical level, I guess, in terms of curriculum design and working with teachers and students or how these ideas find their place uh, in practice. Uh, the project is called Otter. Um, catchy title, though the project doesn't really have to do with authors or not authors alone. Uh, the project is titled Out Outdoor Science Education for a Sustainable Future. So drawing upon to interest of mine, I'm very much interested in out of school learning, learning that happens outside the school, in community settings, in museums, in family environments, uh, in settings like sitting in the car with a parent or sitting at a cafe with friends. What kind of knowledge do we construct in these places? And of course, I'm also interested in uh, promoting goals related to sustainability. This is a European project, the Horizon 2020. It's a large-scale project, and we have uh, over 1.5 million uh, euro for this project. Um, we are eight partners. Uh, we have two universities on this project, and other partners are NGOs or companies. Uh, and we also from different countries in Europe, uh, and I will share more about the, the partner in Spain, uh, which I think might be more in, most interesting to you. So in terms of design of, of this project, we were interested in bringing together anyone uh, who 
pro might be a provider of education. So not only universities, the formal school, but also the informal sector, and that refers to science centers or museums or uh, NGOs or any other organization that engages uh, with science. So uh, the project has to do with uh, plastic waste. So as an introduction to this, uh, I would like you to think about uh, the objects you use um, in the first hour of a morning routine, um, when you wake up in the morning. Think about what do you do during uh, your first hour of being out of bed, and think about all the objects that you use. So I'm guessing most of you share uh, or thought about objects such as a cell phone, um, cater to, to warm up water, something to eat, um, brushing your teeth, eating, getting something for breakfast. But what do we see here? Lots of plastic. Mm -hmm. And before I move on, uh, so the slides are a bit messed up, I wanted to introduce Natalia Helena Azevedo, who is a postdoc in my team. Uh, Natalia comes from Brazil, and she's the one coordinating this project and who also prepared these slides. Uh, so as a way of uh, saying thank you, Natalia, uh, <laughs> for doing this, and you are with us uh, in some ways. Um, so this is exactly what the project um, builds upon, the problem of uh, plastic waste uh, and the big impact, uh, negative impact that plastic has uh, on the environment. And of course, Otter, uh, who is a protagonist of this project in particular. I will share a brief video uh, to share what this uh, project is about. I'm not sure if this will work. Sorry, I'm practicing my Spanish here as well. <laughs> <laughs> Edubunte te hará ver las matemáticas mucho más entretenidas e incluso fáciles. Entras en Edubum. Uh, it's not in Spanish, sorry. <laughs> Imagine kids knew they had the power to change the world and come up with solutions to the world's biggest problems. Imagine we had more scientists to help us fight global challenges like the coronavirus pandemic and climate change. We can move from imagination to reality. If we change something we mostly take for granted, education. At school, STEAM subjects have a reputation for being difficult. Lessons are taught following traditional and theoretical models that are not always designed to be engaging and interesting for pupils. If only STEAM subjects were taught in fun, enjoyable ways, more and more children and teenagers would develop a growing interest in science and the world around them. What can be done? Well, educators, researchers and policymakers have joined forces and developed the education outside the classroom approach 
museums, science camps, outdoor activities and the internet, among others, have become the ideal settings for pupils to become more conscious about the world around them. Students are more engaged, present and alert. They simply enjoy this learning method more, and the results speak for themselves. Their physical and mental well-being is significantly improved, with enhanced social skills being part of the game. Here's where Otter comes into play. We're kicking off with creation of four hubs where we'll bring together educators, researchers and other professionals who want to contribute to making education outside the classroom more popular. Together, we'll develop materials, guidelines and toolkits that teachers can use to implement these activities. We'll then test our methodology in our labs in Spain, Finland, Hungary and Ireland to see if learning STEAM outside the classroom can enhance students' interest and engagement in real-life local matters compared to traditional learning. Lastly, we'll focus on the recognition, validation and accreditation of outdoor learning methods across the EU. Science is our common denominator, and reducing plastic waste is our joint mission. Become an otter, get involved in our activities, let's work together for a more impactful type of education. Learn more at otter-project.eu and follow us on social media. So I hope that gave you an idea of, uh, of what this project is about. We are um, at the beginning of the, of the project where it started in September 2021. Um, and as you saw, we have uh, four countries that are uh, creating these labs and the labs bring together families, students, teachers, um, NGOs, community uh, organizations, uh, to kind of enact a different uh, variety set of practices or activities that engage children of different ages uh, with science. Following on that, we will um, develop a platform for teachers and practitioners with uh, curriculum materials um, that focus on issues related to sustainability, but also identity and development. Uh, the four labs will be launched then in the um, four different countries and then following that uh, the research part um, will be enacted where we will collect data from these uh, four different countries. We're hoping to get data for uh, up to close to 5,000 um, participants and we will use both quantitative and qualitative methods to um, to analyze this data and examine how engagement in these projects supported students in um, developing an understanding about goals related to sustainability, but also self-identifying uh, with science. I will share more about that uh, later on. Uh, so as I said, environmental sustainability is at the core of the project and waste uh, pollution especially but perhaps the most important goal for us is to support the development of students' uh, science identities. Not only their self-view, how they view themselves as uh, science persons or perhaps as future scientists, but also how they are recognized by others. And that is why uh, we have families involved in the project and we have teachers involved in the project as well and members uh, from, the, from the community. So in a way, uh, we're trying to target this possible dichotomy that exists between how children might view themselves and how their environment might, uh, might view them. Uh, in terms of uh, activities or design of the activities, these are framed around uh, culturally responsive and sustaining pedagogies that put a cultural capital of children in the center and especially uh, children that come from underrepresented uh, groups and communities. Um, in terms of out-of-school out school activities, we have a series of different of activities. Uh, science track, which uh, literally means a science track that uh, drives around uh, the country and delivers science, uh, science festivals, science cafes. 
traveling science exhibits, uh, internships with scientists uh, at laboratories, and of, cor and of course we have in-school activities as well with um, pre-service teachers, uh, like most of you here. Um, a set of the materials, the curriculum materials, are uh, framed around identity and aim to support t uh, the students kind of uh, better relate with, uh, with science. Um, so we'll go from the hubs uh, to the design of uh, the guidelines or tools to implement these uh, labs, and I use labs broadly to refer to these different set of activities. Um, and then we will also offer training for educators um, or anyone else interested in implementing these. Now, in terms of research, we're mostly interested in uh, researching these four uh, different areas. First, we want to examine the kinds of design characteristics uh, of effective models of collaborations between schools and out-of-school uh, education providers. And I use school broadly to refer to um, primary school, secondary, high school, and university as well. So we're interested really in um, supporting partnerships between the formal and the informal uh, school sector. Uh, one of the research areas that we're engaging with is uh, how does young people engagement in this activity influence their aspirations for scientific careers? And I don't use that to mean that every single children has to aspire to become a scientist. Uh, but I say that to refer to the possibility of providing them the tools to perhaps imagine themselves as future scientists if they want to. And this is where identity comes in, that's a main research area. Uh, and the last one, uh, the last research area has to do with uh, supporting students' development of knowledge about climate action uh, broadly. So you see here a set of goals that touch upon uh, cognitive domains of learning, affective domains uh, of learning, uh, but also a bit of uh, policy-related goals. And the the overarching goal of this project is to provide a recommendation for the European uh, Commission to, on how to accredit education that happens outside of the classroom. And by accredit, I mean I refer to ECTS. Um, so imagine, for example, by the age of 18, having accumulated uh, 20 CTS because you engage in activities in out-of-school uh, learning. Um, so this is the, the overarching goal of the project. It's, it's a very ambitious goal. I'm not sure that uh, we will man actually manage to do that, uh, but we will put forward a recommendation of how could that happen. So these are the four countries that the implementation will take place. Spain is one of them, Ireland, Finland, and Hungary. Um, and I will share a bit more. Um, uh, so here you see the different ages that are involved. Uh, we have age groups ranging from six to 18 years old. So different uh, countries will target different age groups. And that was purposeful because we wanted to get a kind of a more comprehensive understanding of how uh, students or children of different ages develop uh, science identities and what kinds of activities are, uh, are crucial in supporting them in doing so, depending on their age. I'm going to share a bit more about the Spanish partner. Um, not sure if you're familiar with them. Uh, it's a group of really cool people who have a background in both science and communication. They're called uh, the Big Van Ciencia. Um, and essentially, it's a kind of a traveling group. Um, they engage in different activities, um, in shows, uh, scientific shows, or interviewing scientists. You see here a couple of examples. Uh, they do performances, uh, and it's my understanding they do travel around uh, Spain. They offer a set of activities online, especially in the past uh, two years. Uh, they organize events and conferences as well. 
And they're also on YouTube with more than 40,000 uh, subscribers. So all the information is in, uh, is in Spanish. So I invite you to take a look because uh, they have developed a set of um, really interesting curriculum materials that can be used with any, any group level. And I'm going to talk a bit more about uh, I the identity-based activities that are part of, part of this project. And I'd like to refer to this as possible futures or possible selves, because this is essentially the goal of uh, part of the project uh, for my team, at least. So through the activities, we want to provide children with opportunities to kind of examine their past, present, and future selves, to think about their prior experiences with science, to think about where they are at the moment and perhaps to imagine themselves in the futures or where they want to be in relation to science. Uh, we aim to provide them with opportunities to engage with science in personally meaningful ways, uh, meaning uh, engage with questions that are relevant to them or to their communities or to their local context. We would like to provide opportunities for them to work with scientists from underrepresented groups, uh, women, ethnic and religious minorities, LGBTQIA+, and so on. Opportunities to develop an understanding about the diversity of careers in science or the different fields that scientists could work on, including out-of-school science or public engagement with science. And we also want to provide explicit support and training for both teachers and parents to engage with uh, activities that relate to recognizing their children as uh, science persons. And here is the last slide uh, of, of my talk. Um, here is the website of the project where you can uh, find out more information. As I said, we're at the beginning of the project, so there is not too much in it. Uh, but very soon, we will have um, access to the resources or the curriculum materials uh, that we will develop that uh, will be available to use freely. And they will be uh, available in five different languages, uh, Spanish included. So I invite you to, to have a look sign up for our newsletter and follow us on, on social media if you like. Uh, and of course, you're more than welcome to, to engage or join our team in any way that might be relevant to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> any questions? Um, from people in the room or people on WhatsApp in any way, <laughs> on By WhatsApp. Twitter <laughs> or where, wherever you are. Any questions or comments, Spanish or English uh, or Greek? The project had to start recently, isn't it? But what I saw is that you are planning uh, to work on the same matter, manner. To, uh, and my question is, if, if, if you planted several differences between the social impact to have uh, the, the entorno, the around, yeah, yeah the, the children have around. For example, the influence of economical situation mm. or the political situation, because it, I think it's not going to react the same, or, or the result will be different between um, head, uh, barrios. So well, neighborhood, thank you. Neighborhood, the, from one place to another place. And that's my question. Yeah, gracias. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. And that's a really interesting and relevant question. And yeah, we do, we will try to, to address that. So um, a kind of a secondary goal of the project be, uh, is to examine, is to engage uh, children that come from underrepresented communities. So we are interested in goals related to diversity and inclusion. And yeah, uh, we will use um, pre and post methodologies to 
to see the impact that these activities might have on different groups of children, taking into consideration their backgrounds, the experiences that they bring with them, their cultural um, or social wealth or capital uh, as well. But yeah, we're right. We uh, that's a very critical and timely uh, question to to pose. Um, in practice, it's very difficult uh, to do that. Um, Yeah, it's not a comparative, uh, it's not going to be a comparative study. So we're not going to be comparing countries, but we will comparing groups of students that come from the same place, from the same context. Perhaps it will be a classroom in Finland, so we'll do a pre and post of that classroom in Finland, or a refugee community um, in, in another country, so we'll only uh, do a pre post with, yeah, with that group. Um, but yeah, not across groups comparison, only within groups comparisons. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really great question. Yeah, personal questions are more than welcome. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate the question. Um, I'm going to repeat it in case uh, those on YouTube uh, were not able to uh, hear it. Uh, so I got a question from a young woman here in the room uh, that she referred to as a personal question. So she asked how difficult it was for me as a woman to kind of navigate uh, different places where uh, I lived and work, uh, given my interest and my career in science. Um, Thank you for that. I, I really appreciate it because that's also part of uh, one of the my personal research. Uh, I engage with stories of women in science, so I, I, I essentially aim to explore exactly the same question. Uh, how easy or difficult it was for me? Uh, it was both easy and difficult. Uh, in different places, easier than other places. Um, and I'll share more about uh, this in a bit. But what I want to share is that um, I'm here, I am where I am because of uh, a lot of support that I receive from different communities that are important to me. Uh, mostly other women uh, in science. I had amazing mentors from different parts of the world. And I'm a member of different uh, communities. Uh, like Sarah, for example, has a special interest group on identity. Uh, and it's mostly a group of young researchers doing this kind of work. Uh, so my students, my research team also serves as a, as a resource uh, as well. Um, in terms of difficulties, yeah, the difficulties I face mostly have to do with the fact that I, I work mostly in male-dominated uh, environments. Um, there are structural barriers uh, for women as well, especially those who have uh, families. Um, but there, there, is, there is also a lot of support. So I'm not going to lie and say that, uh, you know, the road was paved with roses. Uh, it wasn't, but um, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have made it uh, where I am right now, but I'm also very, very grateful to the different communities uh, that supported me. Uh, and I want to extend that from the more personal uh, to generalize a little bit, because it is also what the literature says. Uh, so research shows that uh, for women especially, or other people belonging in other uh, underrepresented groups in the sciences, like especially women of color, uh, women who come from refugee communities, they do find support uh, in communities or groups that they set up. Uh, and this range, uh, and these are, in the literature, these, has, these are called counter spaces. So in a way, the places that we create to belong to. Um, and these range from social groups like uh, a group of women who just go together, uh, just go out together and talk about uh, their work and their lives. Uh, a group of 
cycling women. Um, um, I spend a lot of my life on the bicycle, and I do get a lot of, uh, quite often I get a lot of support from uh, the groups that I created uh, that include other people uh, like myself in the sciences. Um, to more kind of structural groups or communities, uh, the one I shared earlier, the special interest identity group of a SERAM, um, but also I'm a member of other writing groups, or uh, I have a group of friends, a network of, uh, of friends that we work together for applying for European grants, uh, for example, and so on. So yeah, but if I would share one piece of advice is uh, find your friends um, and find them early enough in your, in your life. Uh, I carry friendships with me that are more than 25 years old. Um, I'm talking about uh, mentors and friends that I um, that I met in the in the U.S. Uh, when I was younger. Um, so yeah, th those are very important. Okay, another question from Digna. Please read it. Okay, <laughs> nice. Uh, thank you, Digna. What is, what is an example of culturally respectful science education? We have work on women's knowledge or indigenous knowledge, and it has been interesting. But we and our teachers find it difficult to engage with all cultures in a truly diverse classroom and also teach big ideas or core ideas in, in, a, in a discipline. Yeah, that's a very important question and also very difficult to respond to, Dignan, because of, of what you chose to include here, a truly diverse uh, classroom. And I start with that because I, I want to share that classrooms are not how they used to be 10 or 15 years ago. In, Indeed, classrooms have become really diverse in many different ways. Uh, and of course, that uh, has made the work of teachers very, very difficult. Uh, I'll share one example of a work that one of my PhD students is uh, doing in the Netherlands, uh, Taylor Smith. Um, so Taylor built a um, design an out-of-school community program for children in the northern part of the Netherlands that come from a um, they have a Caribbean background, so they're, they self-identify as Dutch Caribbean. So um, she designed curriculum materials uh, based on a co-creation approach. So she designed, uh, this is an after-school program. It happens on Saturday mornings. Um, it brings together children and their families, parents, extended, uh, extended families uh, as well. So they engage in a co-creation approach, meaning inviting the parents to engage in creating the curriculum. An example of that is that uh, we had a woman in the um, uh, parent of one of the children who has bees. So we had a unit on bees. And that included a lot of input from uh, from the parent and also a, a field trip. Uh, she's a bee carer, so uh, she included a field trip to to hear bees. So that's one example that I can think of right now. Uh, another example is that for the same program, we had um, a, so the team was also very diverse. The participants were very diverse, but we found it very useful um, and relevant that the team that developed this program, which was led by Taylor, was also included a very uh, diverse group of people. Um, other people of my team were brought together different languages, um, but also aimed to provide opportunities for students to engage in science without the language, because for some of them, language is a barrier. So a lot more hands-on uh, activities. Um, also questions that come from the students, and that perhaps were the culturally relevant, sustaining uh, component comes in, inviting students to bring in their own, question, uh, their own questions uh, to explore. I hope that uh, that answers uh, your question, Digna. Uh, but it's a very difficult question to, to respond to, but I try. Another question, uh, sorry. Another question from Murcia, from Marina, uh, is about the formal education or uh, out, out, uh, outdoor education. If formal education is direct, uh, directly affects uh, more to all the children, why the focus of the project is an outdoor um, school? 
Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Marina. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm a big <laughs> fan of out-of-school education for different reasons, but mostly for reasons that uh, indeed have to do with cultural wealth or capital or uh, culturally relevant and sustaining pedagogies. Uh, um, I'm not sure that classrooms are designed uh, or well designed for learning. I consider classrooms um, kind of unnatural spaces for learning. Uh, I'm not sure that we were born to sit uh, in rooms and listen to people all day. So that's why I'm a big fan of out-of-school science uh, opportunities because also they provide opportunities for students to kind of bring more of who they are. Um, in the space uh, to make change. Imagine, for example, a trip to a science center. Uh, you make decisions of where to go, where to look for, how much uh, time to spend on an exhibit and, uh, or completely ignore another exhibit. And you cannot do that in a, in a classroom. Uh, for example. So um, I'm very much convinced about the impact of out-of-school learning on people's lives. I'm not so much convinced of the positive impact of uh, classroom learning on people's life, especially specific for specific groups of students. Uh, so not to devalue schooling, of course, and I'm not suggesting to tear, part, tear down all schools and universities. Uh, but I think these spaces have to work extra hard to be really inclusive of all, uh, of all students. But uh, if the question was more about the research, if, we, uh, if Marina, you're interested in finding out uh, if as part of the project we're able to tell uh, what has more influence on students, uh, development, uh, then again, we're not going to do a comparative study. So we kind of take a more holistic or comprehensive approach to, um, to the research. I think that in trying to compare all these different factors, we kind of compartmentalize learning or lives of people. So if I spend uh, 12 hours of my day uh, in different places, then at the end of the day, I'm not thinking, for example, what did I learn in this place, or what did I learn at the other place, or what did I learn from interacting with this one person, or what did I learn from interacting with another person? But in, instead of kind of end the day with thinking about all the things I've done and all the people I, I've met, and, um, and possibly how different I am at the end of the day because of these experiences. Uh, so, but we're not trying to tear apart the different uh, contexts or the different kinds of influences uh, that might shape somebody's identity. Um, okay, I think I, I might have confused uh, Marina <laughs> more. <laughs> Well, I have one question for you. It's a, maybe it's a, a next uh, research that uh, we can propose to you. <laughs> it's about if you, you start uh, at the beginning with the uh, teacher's identities, then uh, science education identities, and when science educators' identities. <laughs> Is, is the next one the, your <laughs> yeah uh, so uh, I did spend a few years studying science educators sci uh, pre-service teachers identities but not science uh, educators and, and from what I know from my understanding of the of the literature there is not a lot of work on that mm. uh, there is definitely a need from that uh, because what we know from research is that teachers in schools, but also uh, science educators, um, university teachers, do have a, um, a lot of impact on the um, development of pre-service teachers' identities, uh, like your, uh, your students. At least this is what I found from, from my work, and I engage with this kind of work. I taught a teacher preparation for more than uh, 10 years in Cyprus, and my research was centered uh, around the question of the types of experiences that pre-service teachers like you uh, have. Uh, 
how these different experiences shape uh, their identities. And one of the more prominent uh, or influential, influential uh, factors were the, um, the educators. So uh, whatever you do, you do a good job uh, Ruth, with, this, <laughs> <laughs> with this group for sure, because I see a lot of engagement um, from your pre-service teachers. But yeah, as an area of research, I definitely think there is value in doing that. And yeah, I would love to join forces, of course, <laughs> with your team. We have Europe. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of work in the future. Well, any question more? And um, well, thank you very much, Lucy. It's, uh, um, well, I am very, very happy to, to be with you here and uh, well, uh, to share with our students and our team, a sense of Infia team. So, it's, uh, thank you very much. Um, um, we can repeat a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, thank to you, Ruth, for the kind invitation. Uh, as I said, I'm a big admirer of what you do uh, in this group, uh, but also the Spanish community in general. So uh, it's an honor to, to have the opportunity to be here with you and to work with you uh, and your team. Um, I hope you found this uh, useful or meaningful in any ways, no matter how small or big was that. Uh, any questions uh, or thoughts, uh, feel free to contact me um, at any time. And thank you to those who join um, uh, online, uh, wherever you are. I appreciate you being with us. Um, thanks a lot. <laughs>